Oh my gosh, hi. Hello everyone, um, apologies for um, being a little late to uh, this. Uh, we were just doing some sound checks for um, a musician who will be uh, ending our show today. And we wanted to make sure that um, it was optimal for you to listen to and remember and just kind of like whisk the evening away. But uh, welcome, welcome to um, today to our Burke event here at the museum. Uh, my name is Rowdy, I'll be your kind of host. I'm just gonna be the bridge between people coming together um, and we have a couple of really wonderful voices and perspectives um, who will be sharing um, more thoughts on, uh, the, on the eruption, on, uh, on what we can learn from it, and also just what are some cool things that like, we can take away from, from that too. Um, so really quickly, I just want to introduce everyone who will be speaking today. Um, Jeff, uh, oh, no, actually Melissa will be our first speaker. Do you want to say hi, Melissa, just really quickly? Okay, and then we'll have Jeff um, after Melissa. Hello, Jeff Riley. Jeff is at the Burke Museum right now, if you can see. And then we will have um, Eric and Cynthia coming on. Hi, Eric. Yeah. And Cynthia is a little way, but Cynthia is there. And then we're going to end with Holly. Um, hi, Holly. Yeah. And uh, with our musical guest, uh, Mira, who is um, Todd Chandler at the moment. Actually, Todd is their um, partner, so. So yeah, so welcome everyone to this. Um, first off, I just want to start off with um, a land acknowledgement. Um, since we are the Burke Museum, it's important to think about um, the places we come from and uh, the lands of, uh, that we are living on today. So the Burke Museum stands on the lands of the Coast Salish people whose ancestors resided since here, or resided here since time immemorial. Many indigenous people thrive in this place alive and strong. So we want to take a moment to think about where we're at what, everywhere in this world, um, think about the lands we're from, the air that we're like smelling, the warmth of the sun, if we, if we have some sun. Um, and today, just sit back, relax, we're going to go on a journey today. Um, today, we're going to look at the eruption, which happened 40 years ago, um, May 18th, 1980. I was not born yet. Um, I was born a little, a little after, so I just heard it through stories. So I'm actually really excited to work on this project, work with all these beautiful people um, to look at this eruption that we look at every single year. Um, but I think today is going to be a really great uh, look at some of the things that maybe we haven't thought about. Um, but I'm going to begin first with a little story, if I can. Um, so let's see. So we're going to look at the eruption. But we also, I want us to look at who was Nancy Helens before. So I'm going to share a story of the first people of the land about the mountains in the area. Okay. <clears throat> I want to take a breath together. I'm going to go back in time. Okay. Before Nancy Helens blew her top, she was a beautiful, a beautifully symmetric, rounded snow capped mountain that stood between two powerfully jagged peaks. Mount Hood, which was called Waist, and Mount Adams, which was also called Klickitak. According to one Indian legend, the mountain was once a beautiful maiden, Luit. When two sons of the great spirit Tahele fell in love with her, she could not choose between them. The two men, Waist and Klickitak, fought over her, bearing villages and forests in the process. Sahele, their father, was furious. He smote the three lovers and erected a mighty mountain peak where each fell. Because Loit was beautiful, her mountain was also beautiful, symmetrical cone of dazzling white. Waist, Mount Hood, lifts his head in pride, but, but, but click attack, Mount Adams wept to see the beautiful maiden wrapped in snow, so he bends his head as he gazes on Mount St. Helens. The Kawalits also call Mount St. Helens um, La Walada, which actually means uh, smoker. So looking at this name, um, the eruption has happened many, many times. Um, but today we're gonna look at just one moment. And uh, as I was doing some research, um, found a, a recording from a Kit AM. Um, this was a Yakimarito station um, around May, 1980 that actually was recorded um, the broadcast. And I'll if I can share that with you a little bit, just to bring us back in time a little more. 
Okay. So it's going to be about a, a about ten minutes. So um, I know it may seem a little long for Zoom time, but the actual original recording is forty five minutes. So I actually took a snippets of it, so I made it a little easy for us um, to listen to. But if you go on YouTube, actually, it's a really interesting um, kind of moment and seeing the ways that people were trying to connect because again 1980s was before cell phones and computers so really the radio was the only thing that connected folks at that time and also the television too as well um, so i'm going to share my sound with you and uh, here it is um yakima radio station um just a 10 minute snippet that's not it <laughs> sorry um i thought that was it okay this one is it from the phone calls we have been receiving here at KIT, we sense a potential panic out there among the citizens of Yakima, uh, Yakima Valley, the county. And uh, I do want everyone in the listening audience to know that KIT and Castrillo will be in touch with the proper officials at the present time. We have on the phone right now this morning, uh, Mayor Betty Edmondson. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. I should say this afternoon. I don't know why I keep saying that. Go ahead, Betty. Oh, that's perfectly normal. I just want to say to the citizens of Yakima, Yakima to not panic, to realize that, um, that the city officials, the county officials, emergency services are in operation. Maybe you necessarily have to hear from them to realize that they are in, are in operation. They're checking the water, the sewer, they're everything. If there's anything that citizens need to be alerted about, you can be sure that you at TIT will be immediately notified uh, so that the citizens will be aware of it. Uh, they shouldn't panic. They should be uh, thankful it's Sunday that they can stay home, keep the doors and windows closed. And I do want to thank the people at KIT because you're there to keep us um, apprised of the situation. Please do stay home. Please do not start calling friends to see how they are. And unless you have an emergency of somebody ill, please don't call um, the hospitals or anything. Now, if you have an emergency in your home, you can always call the on guard number, which is 575-6100, but only on emergencies, not just for information. And we're going to have to see how we get the streets cleared and a lot of things like that. But the city um, services are all alerted, are all trying to get up front to see how they can handle the situation. Okay, thank you much, Betty. You bet. This line right there. Okay, we're now going on the air. This is 1280 KIT. Sheriff Dick Nesbitt. Hello, Sheriff. You're now on the air. Okay. Yeah, we've uh, just got a report now that we've got a major lava flow going northwest and northeast from the mountain. We have a 3,000 acre forest fire <clears throat> off the mountain at the present time. As far as we can tell now, this ash is going to be continuous for some time to come. If people will just stay calm, cool, collected, stay in your homes, Get your drinking water lined up. Don't go outside and please don't drive. This powder is very slick, uh, makes the driving conditions extremely hazardous. There's enough powder on the road now that you can't see the fog lines or the center lines. If they'll stay in, it's very light, it's fluffy, and it'll come up through your carburetor, through your air breather, and the carburetor, and can cause major damage to your vehicles. Thank you very, very much, Sheriff, and uh, I'm sure you'll keep updating us. Oh, yes, as we keep going. Thank you very much. Okay. We understand that uh, ash is falling now on the uh, eastern border of Washington and the western border of Idaho in the Moscow Pullman area. They've got some ash uh, finally falling over there. The winds carried it that far. Also, uh, you know, the telephone company called us a while ago today and uh, told us that uh, you know, they're pretty busy. The uh, phone lines are, are very busy out there at uh, Pacific Northwest Bell. Everybody seems to be trying to get on the telephone to call someone uh, for whatever reason. And uh, we're urging everybody to stay off their telephones now so that we...
Is now so that we can keep the lines clear for uh, emergencies only. Uh, we had a gentleman that walked in the KIT CAT studios here a few minutes ago. He's from the Alpine Taxi Service. They are working now and taking emergency calls uh, for nurses and things like that that have to get up to the hospitals, and they can be reached at 966-4151. Well, we talked with Joyce Savini from the Washington Lung Association earlier. She said it can be irritating if you inhale the smoke or the ash uh, in the lungs. And the best thing to do is stay indoors, keep your windows and your doors shut. And, uh, you know, if you have a problem uh, with your lungs now, if you have asthma or emphysema or anything like that, they suggest that you use a dampened washcloth or handkerchief. By placing that over your uh, mouth and nose, you could use that to breathe with. The special event. No need to worry about volcanic ash polluting the city's drinking water. He says the filtering system has been working well, and the backup water supply deep wells are on standby and could be activated in an emergency situation. Zay says that Yakima City Hall will be closed tomorrow, and he urges all Yakima businesses to remain closed tomorrow to facilitate cleanup operations. Some businesses contacted Newsbeat today to notify, notify their employees that they will be closed. Those include Bailey Manufacturing, Noel Canning, Treetop, Southgate Chrysler Dodge, Yakima Valley Opportunities Industrialization Center, all Yakima and Wapato schools, Yakima Valley College, Yakima Library, Yakima County, and Central Washington University. Of course, many other businesses will be closed tomorrow. We urge that you contact your employer as soon as possible to find out if you are working tomorrow. And there will be no garbage collection service or transit service in Yakima tomorrow. To help out all those stranded, the Red Cross set up five shelters in the Yakima Valley today that offer food and medical assistance. Newsbeat Cindy Nockler has this report. The Red Cross office is busy taking calls from people who are stranded or just worried as to what they should do. Five shelters have been opened to the public and are manned by Red Cross volunteers. Each shelter is equipped with food and one nurse and oxygen tank. According to Red Cross volunteer Gary Gearhart, the shelters are set up specifically for stranded motorists, and he advises everyone else to stay at home, if at all possible. What we're getting is people that have been at conventions, uh, particularly in uh, Yakima and up in Sunnyside, we had a big motorcycle uh, doings going on, and these people got caught. It's mostly travelers that are getting caught and uh, asking for assistance, because everything is pretty well filled up, I think. So far, the shelters operated by the Red Cross have not had a lot of people show up, but they're prepared to handle everyone that finds themselves stranded. As of news time, 10 people have shown up at the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Fruitvale, 150 people at Sunnyside Junior High School, 100 people at Natchez High School, and 10 people at the Civic Center in Sela. For Newsbeat, I'm Cindy Knockler. The biggest group of stranded travelers took up residence at Eisenhower High School in Yakima. 250 amateur radio operators were holding a convention when the volcano eruptions began. Trin Huffman was there and files this report. These ham radio operators from around the state were ready to head home when the skies turned dark, filling up with sifting ash. Some conventioneers tried to leave Yakima, but a spokesman says most turned back immediately. Ham radio officials quickly moved to start food and beverage services. By late this afternoon, the stage was set for a massive emergency effort. Uh, we have been declared in an emergency site here. Uh, we had a amateur radio convention here this morning, and since we had the school open, they declared this particular site uh, one of the emergency locations. Uh, we are checking into bedding facilities at this time. We do have food uh, available here for anybody that can stop in. They can feed approximately 800 people for two days here right now. They're set up. They are ready to feed at this time, and uh, we do have other... Um, facilities here for them, um, there's some TV, news, radio, whatever. Spirits were high at Ike today, with stranded travelers reading, talking, and watching television to pass the time. The people we talked to were hoping they could leave before the novelty wore off. Corinne Huffman reporting for Newsbeat. The recommended equipment for those journeying outside is a face mask of cotton material, and it works best if it is moistened. Dr. Lee McFarland of St. Elizabeth's Hospital recommends staying indoors if possible. It says masks should be worn outdoors. But McFarland says the falling matter should not be physically damaging. 
the uh, particles themselves are really quite neutral in pH, so they're not uh, much of a danger from a, either an acid or a basic uh, irritation, but they uh, are also quite large, so they don't get into the uh, deep respiratory passages. They will be trapped when you breathe through your nose by the nasal uh, hairs and the lining of the nose. If you breathe through your mouth, they'll be trapped uh, usually in the back part of the throat or in the upper respiratory passage of the, the trachea. The best thing to do to uh, avoid that is to just uh, use a mask like you have, a uh, cotton uh, cloth, maybe moistened, will help to filter out some of this. But even if it does get back into your nose and throat, the biggest problem is one of irritation and cough. Yes, we've had probably uh, a handful, maybe uh, 10 or 12, who have had symptoms, but in each instance they've all been very high respiratory symptoms, and we've had no one of the hundreds of people in at Yakima who do have asthma. We have had no one come in with an asthma attack yet today. While the matter shouldn't reach your lungs, it can create a very unpleasant tickling sensation in the nose and throat. The best way to deal with the fallout is to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, Health officials say if eye irritation results from contact with the ash, you should rinse your eyes thoroughly with cold tap water. Bob Romero reporting for Newsbeat. Hey, thank you so much, everyone, for thank you so much, everyone, for for going on that little journey. Again, um, it's only ten minutes, but I think it really gave you some context at that moment. Um, and a lot of the times, we look at the human stories, right, um, for this. So I'm going to have Melissa kind of join us a little bit uh, to share some that the work has. Or yeah, go ahead, Melissa. All right, thank you, Rowdy. And it was it was so great to just listen to that radio broadcast. It really put me back in time, I know. Um, yeah, we could think about it first. Like, what were your thoughts that were coming to you when you heard it? Well, actually, uh, um, some of the stories that I'm about to share from our members are really similar to what was just broadcast. I, I, I'm excited because we actually have someone who reached out to us who was one of those stranded travelers that we were just hearing about. So I'm excited to share uh, this with everybody here. Um, I am the membership manager at the Burke Museum. So it's my job to oversee our membership program. At the Burke, we have um, a member family of about 4,000 households, and they all love the Burke and choose to support us every year. The members that we have are kind of the backbone of our museum. So um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here right now. And I just want to say a huge thanks to all of our members that are listening tonight. We are so thankful for everything that you do for us. Um, I also want to thank everyone here that donated when they registered for this event today. Uh, the last I checked, we were up to almost $2,000 just from this event alone. And I just think it's really almost unbelievable how much support we've had from the community since our museum had to close. And every single donation that comes in um, is reminding us that you all care really deeply about the work that we do at the Burke. So thank you so, so much for your generous gifts tonight. Um, so members are also important to us though, not just from the financial contributions that they make, but because we really think of them as part of our Burke family. Our members visit often, they get to know our staff, they ask really great questions at our events, um, and they also like to share their own lives and stories with us. So a few weeks ago, we asked all of our members if they wanted to share their memories of the 1980 eruption, and a lot of them reached out to tell their stories. Uh, as someone who's not local, I'm not from Washington, and I also was not born yet when this eruption happened, I've been having such a great time listening to their stories and reading them. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to share some of those stories with you all tonight. So one of our members, Reed W., was at his home on Mercer Island with his wife when the mountain exploded. They were sleeping in on a Sunday morning when they heard a large boom. But since their house overlooked the I-90 floating bridge, they were actually really used to hearing loud booms from car accidents below. So they heard the boom and thought nothing of it, went back to sleep, and then went on with their day as normal. 
Uh, he says, it wasn't until the late afternoon that we knew anything had happened. There was gardening, reading the paper, cooking. Remember, this was before cell phones and social media. Later that day, we heard from East Coast relatives that were asking how we were. We also got a call from friends who'd been on a Mountaineers climb well north of Seattle, who had heard the blast and also witnessed the plume, abandoning their climb. The biggest effect for us wasn't until the following October. We were on a massive one-day drive home to Mercer Island from Yellowstone via Jackson Hole and the Snake River. Crossing the Idaho-Washington border before dawn, we found ourselves in a grayed out landscape, volcanic dust swirling around the car like powdered snow. Headlights were dimmed in the foggy conditions, but we finally crossed Snoqualmie Pass and were able to breathe the moist Puget Sound air. Um, another one of our members, Robin L, was in Chehalis, not um, for the first eruption, but when the second eruption hit on May 25th. This is how they remember it. I woke up to it being dark. At 6 a.m., it looked like it was snowing. We got perhaps a quarter of an inch of very fine ash and schools were closed for the year. I drove the wife and kids up to Bremerton to stay with family and I had to shovel the road and sidewalk, then sweep it, then wash it down. Otherwise, every car driving by created a new blizzard. The city dumped all the ash in the park next to the freeway and then tour tourists carted it off. I had spent years hiking and camping in the Mount St. Helens area. It felt like a great loss. For many, the loss included lives, property, business, as well as memories of what it was before. Another member, Joan, was actually on a trip to London when the eruption happened, but she remembers seeing the newspaper headlines all the way on the other side of the ocean. Uh, but they didn't actually, it didn't occur to them that the headlines were about a mountain that exploded in their own home state of Washington. They didn't find out until two days later when they were flying back to the States. And she says, we found ourselves in a bed and breakfast with other Washington residents and learned the eruption was Mount St. Helens and that all flights into Seattle were canceled. Months later, we were at a temporary visitor center at the mountain when a later eruption happened. We had been watching a video of the original eruption when a ranger came in and said that the real thing was happening right outside. We went out to watch, but several people continued to watch the television rather than the real thing. So the ranger went in and pulled the plug on the TV to force people to look out at the actual event. They drove home afterwards to Arlington with the eruption in their rear view mirror the whole time. So from these stories, I think it's so interesting to hear that no matter where people were, whether they were in London or right here in Washington, um, they have these memories that have stuck with them for 40 years and that they're probably never going to forget. I think it's great that thanks to their collective memories and their storytelling, even those of us who were not alive or in Washington at the time can still get a taste of what it was like to live through and how we can prepare for other catastrophic and uncertain times. So we also asked our members and fans to tell us what they think they learned from the eruption and what we can continue to learn from it today. A lot of them touched on how important it is to listen to scientists and pay attention to the warnings that are issued and always be prepared for unexpected emergencies like volcanoes or earthquakes or pandemics. Um, but some people also emphasize the resilience and magnificence of nature. So Robin said that nature has recovered much faster than people su suspected. Only the ash plain and crater still look desolate and even they are doing their own sort of recovery on their own timetable. We learn that life moves forward, whether we cope or don't cope. Um, another one of our friends, Evie Armitage, was in Pullman, Washington when the eruption took place on her 12th birthday. Now every year she has a volcano themed birthday party with baking soda and vinegar volcano that her kids erupt for her. She says that kids are interested in volcanoes and that this is a fun way for them to learn. The story of the regeneration of the blasted area around the volcano shows us nature's resilience and how science can learn from these catastrophic natural events. Finally, I just wanna share one more reflection from Cindy Z, 
she um, was one of these stranded travelers that we just heard on the radio broadcast. Um, she was unable to get to her home in Pullman, Washington when the eruption happened and instead had to spend four nights at Rosalia High School with 400 other stranded travelers. She said that the event changed her life and she was impressed, inspired, and heartened by the experience. She told us that human beings are amazingly resilient and our instinct to pull together in order to correct problems and create solutions is strong and life-sustaining. In this post-COVID-19 reality that we are enduring and adjusting to, I am reminded by the masks of the ones worn to protect against inhaling the ash. I am also reminded of our abilities to adjust and adapt and of my life-altering lessons of May 1980, now 40 years ago. We are impressive, clever, and beautiful species in spite of our flaws and in light of our challenges. I think our members are amazing. I think these stories are amazing, and I am so glad I got to share them tonight, and I'm so thankful for everyone here listening tonight. Um, if you'd like to hear a few more stories, we do have some posted on our website, too, in a digital gallery, so be sure to check those out. But for now, I'm going to say goodbye and pass you back to Rowdy. Thank you so much, Melissa, and for all the members and folks who ended up sharing. Uh, I was going on journeys everywhere, like left and right, up and down. Um, I just can't imagine all that ash, uh, like just everywhere. Um, but I think you put up a good point about like nature and how a lot of the times we look at the eruption through human lens. But I think what we're going to show you today and the folks who are on this call um, are going to share the ways that nature like bounce back and the ways that we can learn from the landscapes around us too. So right now I'm gonna introduce uh, Jeff Bradley, our uh, mammalogy collections manager, who's at the Burke right now, as you can see all the different horns in the background. <laughs> and he was just moving stuff around. So Jeff, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Um, and then, yeah, please, uh, please go. Yeah. Eat myself. Great, thanks Rowdy. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, yeah, my name is Jeff Bradley. I'm the collection manager of mammals here at the Burke Museum. Uh, to understand what a collection manager does at the Burke, you can think of the collection as a library. In my case, a library of mammal specimens. And I'm the librarian. Okay, I, I report to the curator of mammals. She's my boss. But the main focus of my job is to make our specimens available to users. Primarily for us, for the research collection, our users are scientific researchers, but we also have a lot of artists and educators who use our specimens. Um, and so a lot of my job is, is, is helping users of today. Right? I'll, I'll give loans, we'll give loans to, of specimens to people, or we'll host them here, give them workspace, give them access to the collection so they can do their work here. Um, uh, but, my, but my job also includes caring for the collections, long term so that they will continue to remain available to researchers far into the future okay as you may have noticed i'm right now inside the burke museum's mammal collection now the burke museum is still closed and like most everyone else uh we've been closed since the stay at home order started in march um and i'm being being allowed to be in here for this for for a few reasons for one i'm already one of the very few people allowed to be in here uh because I look after our colony of domestic beetles, our flesh-eating beetles that clean our skeletons for us. Um, and uh, since my end job involves feeding live animals, that means I'm essential for a few hours a week anyway. Um, and I come in to make sure that the beetles are being fed, which really just means making sure that none have escaped and none have. Uh, but mostly I'm here because we thought this was a great place to have this my part of the conversation, right? I get to tell you a couple of stories about specimens that were collected at Mount St. Helens that now live here in this room. And we thought it'd be great to be able to have this conversation while I'm standing here, good context. But we also thought that this was an important reminder for everybody, okay? We're gonna be back and you are gonna be back. Burke's working hard on a plan to open this museum and to do it in a way that keeps everybody safe and healthy. Okay? We don't know exactly what that'll look like yet, but soon we're gonna have researchers like me back in here, and soon after that, we're gonna have the public back in here. 
and we can't wait. Okay? So, about Mount St. Helens. All right, I get to tell you a couple stories about Mount St. Helens, and I really enjoyed those stories that Melissa just shared with us. And I get to tell you two of my favorite stories. These are two of my favorites anytime I have to talk to a group of people about the Mammal Collection. Anytime anyone asks, why do you have so many, right? Um, uh, and I like these stories because they're really good examples of showing you the types of knowledge you can get from a mammal collection, right? From a museum collection. But it's more than that that makes these stories my favorite. And this is where I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna start the show, start my slideshow, okay? So yeah, more than just them being good examples of what you can get out of a collection like this. Um, uh, it's about Mount St. Helens, right? Mount St. Helens, it really strikes a chord with people, right? Uh, either we can remember it blowing, or we have visited since then. This here is a shot of my daughter's seventh grade class, just last May, in fact, a year ago tomorrow. Um, so a lot of people, especially people here in the Northwest, we've got a connection to that volcano. It's definitely part of our, our natural history uh, and our cultural history as well. Um, I mean, even me, I was in upstate New York, eight years old, my hometown, and I can remember my dad pointing to the sunset and he said, uh, you know that volcano you heard about on the news? Um, well, that's why the, the colors are so bright right now. Um, uh, third grade, I brought a jar of, later that year, I brought a jar of Mount St. Helens ash into show and tell for third grade. And I can't quite remember how we got the hold of that ash from New York, but I do remember I was the coolest third grader that day. Um, and when I went away to college, I went to Evergreen State College, just a couple miles north of the mountain, of the volcano. And soon after I got there, I went to visit. I could still remember driving through the blast zone. Oh, it was just as cool as I had imagined it. It really did look like matchsticks. I mean, it was just so amazing, right? Um, my first job out of college, it was with the Forest Service. I spent some of my first summer working on Mount St. Helens, setting up research plots, including some small mammal trapping grids inside the blast zone. And this shot here is, is a view during our morning commute those mornings. And afterwards, I'd also keep coming back a bit on my own time. I've hiked across the pum pumice plains with some friends. Here's another shot from the pumice plain looking north towards Spirit Lake there. And I kept going back, not as often as I'd like, but my wife and I summited to the Crater Rim in 2003. And here's a shot looking north from the rim down into the crater. You can see the the bulge in the crater, you can see Spirit Lake and then Rainier on the horizon. And then now, as collection manager here in the Berg, I'm the caretaker for specimens that have been collected on Mount St. Helens, including some that were collected from those mammal trapping plots I helped install back in 1994. So it's a big part of my cultural history too, and I admit that that might be the reason why these stories are my favorite. But they're, it's also because they're excellent examples of the types of information you can get from studying museum specimens. So. Story one, the elk in the cardboard box, as they're named by Eric Wagner, who you get to hear from next. And so this artist's rendition right here, this is what most people think of when they think of an elk. But this, this is what I think of when I think of an elk. Because the Burke has over 100 elk skeletons that were collected from within the blast zone soon after the Mount St. Helens eruption boxes and boxes and boxes of skeletons, skeletons like this one, most of which are currently stored right in this room with me. This research team that collected these skeletons, they basically hiked the blast zone for the first couple summers, looking for elk bones poking out of the ash, and every time they found some, they'd record the exact location and collect all the bones they could. Since all the scavengers who would have scattered those bones had also been killed by the blast, most skeletons were lying right where they fell. And the bones also provide a lot of information. Some of the skeletons, like the ones you can see here, they were left fairly intact. And by the way, this is only part of the skeleton that we have from this animal. I think it took us three shots to get all the bones from this one. But you can clearly see that some of these skeletons are really good shape. 
right? Some of them really don't have any visible trauma at all. Others, others you can see quite a bit of damage. And then you see some skeletons. Oh yeah, that's just one with a lot of damage. But then you see some skeletons like this. Yeah, my mouse works, right? So this skeleton here, this can tell you a lot, right? You've got the bones of an adult, adult female. Here's her mandibles, her jaw bones right there. Those are her scapula. And they're mixed in with some bones of a newborn elf. Right there is the scapula. Right there is the jaw bone, right? So this skeleton here can tell you a lot. For one thing, it tells you where this female elk wanted to be when she was going to give birth, right? That would be when her calf would be really little and too small to run and super valuable to predators, super vulnerable to predators, <laughs> as well as valuable. And that was information that biologists at the time didn't really know well, okay? Females typically disappear shortly before they give birth. They go hide someplace. And then they show up again a few weeks later accompanied by the new calf once it's old enough to run a bit. And before the age of GPS collars, it was really difficult to get good data on where this crabbing, this critical calving habitat occurred. Then, morning of May 18th, 1980, boom, that mountain took a snapshot of where all its elk were at that moment. And since it was right during calving season, well, there's your habitat data. You just need to be able to interpret that snapshot, okay? Here's another handsome shot of that mama elk's bones. But now, gonna move on to second story. My second and last story talks about the uh, efforts to study the recovery, right? The, uh, the successional recovery of the landscape. Um, and uh, a lot of that focus, okay, yes, because almost exclusively after, or almost immediately after the eruption, right? Some people figured out, hey, this would be a perfect natural experiment. We can limit human activities within some of this destroyed landscape. Then we can watch nature do her thing. Right? You can see how we as humans would be interested to know how nature re recovers from this sort of event. Right? And much of the monitoring that's been done is focused on the small mammal communities around the mountain. Um, it used a series of trapping locations that were spread along a gradient of disturbance zones. Okay, so this is an overhead photo. And what happens here, it's sort of looking to the southeast. And uh, the moment blue, yeah, the disruption blew northwards down towards the left corner, and it resulted in a gradient of destruction. Closest to the crater up here, we have the most total destruction. That was known as a pumice plain. Basically, the entire mountaintop slumped to the north, slumped down, total buried everything, and then combined with some pyroclastic flow afterwards, it really just wiped out all life right in this area. Okay, the red dot shows the rough collection locations for this habitat zone, this destruction zone. You get a little farther away, kind of in this area here, that's what's called the blowdown zone, where the force of the blast was enough to knock over the trees. Okay, there's a lot of variation in this zone, right? A lot of topography, um, a lot of microclimates, some late season snow, and these provided some refugia for some small mammals to survive the eruption. And those survivors would have a big effect on the succession that was to come. Now a little farther outside the blow, blow down zone, you get a narrow scorch zone where the blast was hot enough to kill the trees but not strong enough to knock them over. And they also monitored some areas beyond the scorch zone which had a lot of ash fall. And then of course they put some control plots over here and some similar habitats that were not impacted by the blast, but that's what good scientists do. And I'm only gonna share a little bit of uh, the data here with you a very little data compared to what was collected, what was published. Um, it's gonna be focused right here on this area of most complete destruction. Now remember, back in 94, 14 years on, this area was still looking completely destroyed. Um, but uh, what they found, okay, because remember one of the main things that they were looking for was how long before small mammals will come back and recolonize this totally ha hammered habitat. Um, and the mammal survey said that the mammals came back a lot sooner than was expected, okay? This, this uh, table here shows the year that each species was first trapped on the pumice plain, on that really intensely disturbed area. Now, some of these arrival dates were helped by the fact that some small mammals survived within the blowdown zone, especially the deer mines, 
and the pocket gopher. Um, so many of these species, a few of them anyway, didn't have that far to go to get here. Okay, now um, this is the part where I'm going to end my show. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Technically, I'm not ending my show. Got another minute or two. But I wanted to show you this. Okay. This is basically a different way to show you the same data that we showed in the table a minute ago. Okay. So here, these are specimens collected from within the pyro uh, pyroclastic flow zone of the Mount St. Helens. And they're ranked in order that they arrived. This first one here, deer mouse, first one to show up. But by 2013, we had all these animals back on the pumice plain. This is the entire cast of characters, the entire suite of species that they would have expected to be in that area before the blast. And by 2013, they had all been back. Uh, I'm only showing ones that were trapped there. There are also a handful of species that they uh, knew they were there from direct observation. Um, but Wanted to show you that. And that makes another point, okay? These specimens in that cabinet, and that goes for everything in this room, these specimens are not yet done, okay? The initial data have been, been recorded, you know, species ID, uh, reproductive condition, and they've been uh, published about considerably uh, as part of what we've learned about the last 40 years with the mountain, right? But the best part about he, having these specimens here at the Burke is that we can keep asking questions of them. That's something you can't get from visual observations alone, right? I mean, sure, you can be sure that you saw that species of mammal in that location. Maybe you get a good photo, so you got a decent idea of what fur looked like at the time, right? But unless you've archived that animal with this data in, in a museum like this, you're never going to be able to ask anything else of that specimen. Okay? And who knows what we might want to ask of it, right? Especially as technology continues to give us new tools to get data out of these specimens. Right? Especially as our knowledge grows and we can think of new questions we never thought to ask before. Okay? I mean, in a few years, we're going to be able to take some of these specimens from Mount St. Helens, probably be able to cheaply analyze their tissues for, I don't know, effects of living in ash, right? How does that affect your longevity, your genes, your microbiome, right? Or maybe we'll be able to compare Mount St. Helens specimens from next century with these original founding stock, right? See how these populations change. Using technology, I wouldn't even be able to comprehend and ask some questions I couldn't even imagine, all right? So I think that's a good place to leave it here to wrap up um, because that really, I hope, you know, drives home why these specimens are here. That's why people put so much effort into making sure that they get here and that they get archived in these drawers and in our database. And so these specimens can continue to be used in the future because one other thing that St. Helens helps remind us is that things are going to continue to change. And it'd be good for us to understand how our planet works. And I'm done. Rowdy, can you take it back or do I give it back? Oh, no, I will. Uh, no, thank you again. Thank you. Let's say everyone, um, round of applause to uh, um, Jeff right here. I know you can hear it, um, but you can feel it around the world right now. It's sending you energy. So clap, 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 clap. Thank you so much. Um, there were also a couple of questions that were asked during your talk. Okay. Um, and I know you have to leave, but yep. what um, what you said was that we're going to uh, catalog I'm... these questions and send it to you, and mm -hmm. then we'll um, answer it when you can. So Happy to answer more questions. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you so much for those who are asking. Um, I think some folks later in the um, show will be able to answer, but I think Jeff has to get out of the museum right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. So now um, we're going to head into um, learn a little more with uh, two of our folks. Uh, we have Eric, uh, like author Eric Wagner and Professor Cynthia Chang. Um, Eric is an author of a book called After the Blast, um, and they'll talk so much more. It's actually come, it came out, right? It, it just came out. Yep. Um, and uh, Professor Cynthia Chang will be here to, to talk. They're just going to take some like 15 minutes and just talk to each other. So everyone just sit back and uh, enjoy. So please. Stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Eric Wagner. I wrote a book uh, after the blast, um, the ecological recovery of Mount St. Helens, and so it's been really interesting now hearing the accounts uh, from the day of, you know, the the I don't know, just the sort of sheer sort of terror of living through the eruption um, or the you know 
the anxiety that it promoted. So the book that I wrote focused mostly on the ecological research that occurred afterwards and how the how that story, how the story of Mount St. Helens and the eruption wasn't really done with the eruption, but it just sort of keeps extending outward. And so today what I wanna do is talk a little bit uh, with so, who, somebody who was in my book, um, Cynthia Chang, who's a professor of uh, biology at the University of Washington in Bothell. And I first met Cynthia in 2015 at an event called The Pulse. And so every five years or so um, since 1980, all the biologists, all the scientists who work at Mount St. Helens gather together uh, in the summer to, to talk and sort of, you know, meet and, and chat and, and take uh, data from some studies that they've been studying, you know, places they've been working since 1980. And this was, I went to this pulse in 2015 when I was just starting this book. And the, so the intent was to kind of get a sense of what people were doing. And I was totally overwhelmed. There was just so much going on. There were so many people doing so much interesting stuff. And I just thought, oh my goodness, there's no way I'm ever gonna be able to, to capture the so, sort of full breadth of what is happening here from a research standpoint. And, so one day, so I'm there and I'm feeling totally overwhelmed. And um, I was just kind of trying to talk to people and see if they would take me out places. And Cynthia, I went, I had heard Cynthia sort of introduce herself the day, you know, a couple of days before. And I knew that she was working out in, in this place called the Plains of Abraham. And so I asked her if she would mind if I came out with her one day. And she said, oh, that's great. And so she and I and her field assistant, Laurel, um, Laurel Baum went out and it was just this absolute, just beastly hot day in late July. It was like 98 degrees. Um, it was, you know, in Mount St. Helens, if you've ever been out there, it's just a completely exposed landscape. And, and Cynthia didn't seem affected at all. I was dying, you know, I was, I was slugging water. I was, felt woefully unprepared. Cynthia just charged right through and, and we were out in this big empty space. She was looking for some old research plots. And I was, I was just blown away kind of by her energy and just the you know, curiosity and how quickly she, you know, her mind worked. And so today I just want to kind of introduce you all a little bit to Cynthia and, and a little bit of her work. And so um, Cynthia, I just wanted to sort of ask how you initially became interested in Mount St. Helens as a research space, because if, if I remember correctly, that was your first real time being out there, wasn't it? Or Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm originally from the East Coast. I was born um, in New York and lived in the East Coast my whole life. Um, and I had never been to Washington State um, ever. Um, but I had heard about Mount St. Helens, um, so I, I was not yet born yet when the eruption happened, but I heard about it in elementary school, and you learn about it in college, and in ecology class, um, and so I was a graduate student um, in Connecticut, and I was about to finish um, my PhD, and I was sitting, uh, eating lunch one day, reading our ecology journal, and I read this um, article that a professor out here at UW-Seattle, his name is Roger Del Morel, he published his 30 year data set. Um, and I remember thinking, oh my God, that is amazing. 30 years of data is a really, really long time. And he's making it publicly available to anyone who wants to use it um, to do research. Um, and so I thought that was really cool. And I, I decided to write a grant to the um, National Science Foundation. Um, and I was really lucky and it, it got funded. Um, so I actually, I moved out to Seattle just to do research on Mount St. Helens. Um, and it totally changed the course of my life. Um, I, I had never been here before. I kind of drove across the country and I was only supposed to do a two year postdoc, but I ended up getting to stay in the area. Um, I got offered a faculty job position out here and I continue to do research. And it's literally all because of Mount St. Helens um, changing my life that way, yeah. Cool. <laughs> So could you tell me a little bit about what your initial sort of research question was at Mount St. Helens? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a plant ecologist. Um, and so one of the big questions that we are really interested in understanding is understanding how communities in general respond to disturbance. Um, how do they recover? Um, and how quickly do they recover? Do they recover in different ways, different areas? Do they recover in different ways? Um, and we know that Mount St. Helens, it's um, in any disturbance area, um, there are a lot of different legacy effects. Um, there's different variations in the habitat. Um, and so that can set communities to go in these different trajectories. Um, and so one big question in ecology is trying to understand, okay, do communities kind of follow the same pattern um, through time? If they do, what can we expect to see, you know, in after a certain amount of time? If they don't follow a certain pattern, that's also interesting. And why don't they follow a certain pattern? Um, and it, all this kind of research is really, really relevant because disturbance is happening all the time, not just volcanoes, um, you know, hurricanes, fire, um, lots of different kinds of disturbance. Climate change is a man-made kind of disturbance. And so all of this theory and kind of research um, kind of helps inform lots of other kinds of disturbances and understanding how communities um, change. And so Mount St. Helens is really great because um, well, for a lot of reasons, it created this really cool gradient of different kinds of disturbance. Um, but the other great thing about it is that um, the human legacy of, of scientists going out immediately after the eruption, we have some data pre-eruption and we have a wealth of data after the eruption. And so being able to build off of um, people's entire careers, like my career is building off of other people's careers. And we just have this great wealth of data and that's really, very unique and valuable resource. So that's interesting. You talk a little bit about legacies. How one of the things that was interesting to me in working on this book was was that the sense of transition between the the sort of original research community, if you will, of folks who worked at the mountain in 1980 or started at 1980 and then continued, and then people like you. It's sort of it's almost like this cohort that's that's really risen in the past, you know, five years or so of new researchers who are taking over these projects. And so how, I mean, like ecology is kind of, has changed a lot since 1980. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it's like as a, as a sort of modern ecologist, if you will, to take over the, the sort of older questions and how you're able to use data that were collected in particular ways or, um, you know, things that you wish people had done differently, although I know that hindsight is 2020. Um, but just what is it, what is it like to sort of come into a research community that's already very well established like that and then just sort of pick up their question and carry the baton? Yeah, I mean, that's the great exciting thing about research. I mean, we really benefit. So ecology often things happen slow, plants only grow once a year. And so to be able to like come in with already 30 years of data is a huge asset, um, but of course, you know the, there are things that we, we we are excited to be able to add to. And so, one one cool thing is there there are a lot of new techniques um, with with computers and being faster and a lot of data analyses. Um, one thing that I was able to do with a lot of my students was um, kind of look at the data in a new way using some more modern um, uh, computational methods. Um, and then we also have a lot more. Um, you know, molecular tools at our disposal. We haven't pursued that as much, um, but yeah, there's, there's, that, that's what makes it great is we can use kind of the old, um, the, the base foundation of knowledge to kind of inform which direction is interesting, and um, we can kind of go from there and kind of keep building on that. Hopefully, for another thirty years, forty yeah. years. <laughs> so that well, that's another. I mean, that's another thing that I was curious about is that. You know, a lot of the time, like the way that we're talking right now, you and I have of sort of, you know, succession in terms of researchers, like ecologically, geologically, you know, this is still pretty early in the in the successional process, I would I would imagine. And so we're, I mean, one of the things that I'm always been curious about to look at Mount St. Helens is like where what's going to change there now, like in what you've watched and how the community that you know, the plant community, the biological community has changed so far how do you how will it change you know in the future and as a as a ecologist what sort of most excites you in that way yeah well that's the million dollar question right like what what what's going to happen in the future that's why 
that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, but you know, one cool thing that um, has happened um, with with the Mount St. Helens research is, um, so um, Jeffrey talked a little bit about the different zones in the on the mountain. There's the blast zone that I work in, the Pumice Plains. It's the most severely de devastated site. The blowdown zone is a little further away, and then the Tephra zone is where kind of all the ash fell a little bit further away from the mountain. Um, and there were teams of researchers working in each of these zones. And for the previous 30 years, they, you know, they kind of all kind of did their own research and published those papers. Um, but um, when the when a lot of the new researchers came about, we, you know, we sat down, we were like, okay, well, what is the big overarching pattern across the entire mountain? And so we actually got together and did this giant synthesis where we synthesized across the entire disturbance gradient. And what's really cool is we've seen um, unexpected patterns. Um, so the most severe site um, has actually kind of not changed that much. And I, I think now in hindsight, it's because it's just so harsh out there. Um, and it's actually the blowdown zone that's kind of doing all these crazy different things, going in different, the communities are going in different directions. Um, and so much of it is because of these um, legacy effects, biological legacy effects um, that kind of happened. Um, but what I'm really excited about is, you know, in another 40 years, is that still going to be true? Um, in the blast zone, um, we're starting to see trees slowly establish. And as they establish, they're probably going to have a huge impact on the surrounding plant community. Right now, we mostly see like mosses and flowering plants and grasses. So, you know, when that community shifts and transitions, is it going to be fast and all of a sudden the community changes really quickly or is it kind of going to be this slow pace? Um, and we can only answer those kinds of questions with time um, because you know, plants grow not that fast. <laughs> um, and I think I promised, I'm, I'm happy to share some quick pictures of, of the pumice plain if, 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 we, if we want to. Um, that would be great. Okay. Pull them up. Um, so yeah, this is this is what this is what it looks like. Um, so you can see it's there. This is um, this is on the pumice plane, and this, this is some of our researchers. There's Eric over here. Eric left out in his his very kind story. Um, the first time he came out and did interviewed me, I, I made him carry a bunch of really heavy field equipment, um, a lot of rebar and 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 things. So he was very kind to help out with the research. Um, and, and so that's kind of, oh, I have one. Oh, so that's kind of what our plots look like. And you can see that there are trees there, but um, it's still mostly a lot of different kinds of um, low growing plants. Um, and that's us collecting data in the field. So yeah, my students, I have a, have a fun time out there too. Neat. And I guess one last question for you then would be, I mean, I'm just sort of curious, like, what did it feel like for you as a scientist? Like, what did it feel like to be written about? That was, that was very interesting. I, I kind of, I don't know, I think my childhood dream was always to like be featured on, you know, I wanted to be a scientist and you know, you've really made it when you're on like National Geographic or like in some books. So in one way I was like really excited, but um, it, it was, it was definitely uh, different. Um, but one thing that really helped me was, um, you know, it's, I, I really enjoyed talking to you, especially because you're you're a fellow scientist. You're also an ecologist, and so you you really get it. Um, and so I wasn't worried about the science or whatever I was seeing being being misinterpreted. Um, I I thought it was a really really interesting and, and cool experience, and I'm very grateful that you took the time to get to know me and my students and and our research. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, well, thanks. That that. <laughs> yeah, this, well, thank you. It was very nice to to get to sort of learn about your research too. And I didn't, yeah, and if people are interested, you can read about Cynthia in After the Blast. And thanks, I don't know, thanks Rowdy for having me and that now I'll give it back to Rowdy. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, thank you both for sharing a little bit too. Um, we do have a question from our audience. Um, would, you, uh, would you be open to answering that or? See if that's yeah. possible. Sure. Okay, so um, we have a person they asked, um, was the date of the event May springtime? Did that help species of trees? I'm wondering if some trees were spared as they were buried by protective snow. Maybe possible? Yeah, that's very, very insightful. Actually, the fact that the mountain erupted in May is huge. 
Um, and that's, that's kind of what I was alluding to with those biological legacy effects. Um, so the mountain was still covered in snow and a lot of that snow um, actually protected, in, not everywhere, um, in the blowdown zone. Um, it protected some of the understory. And so what resulted was that not everything was killed in certain areas and that um, has really dictated which communities can recover really quickly and which communities were really devastated and could not recover as quickly. Um, and so we would see, we would probably be seeing something really different if, if the volcano had erupted even just four months later. Later in the summer, the snow would have melted um, and, and a lot more plants would have been yeah. Beautiful. And one more question. Um, what types of trees usually grow at that elevation? Um, yeah, so in the in the blast zone, uh, you, well, pre-eruption, it, it, it was kind of the, the typical um, Doug fir, um, subalpine fir, noble fir um, kind of uh, forest. And uh, now in the blast zone, um, we are starting to see the same species established. So, um, so it's very dominated by noble fir, um, and um, dug fur out there. Um, but, but I don't know if you saw the pictures. By dominated, I mean there, there's a couple like spread throughout the, the area and eventually it'll, it'll kind of turn. Um, but in the, in the blowdown zone, um, we see kind of the same kind of species, but they're a lot bigger and dominant. And, and there are a lot of um, alders out there. Alders and willows are the other big, um, they're not conifers, they're the, the broad leaves. Um, alders and willows are the other very common trees out there. Yeah, thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Eric, too. Um, so yeah, um, if you want, again, Eric, uh, would you want to share a little more where folks can um, read more about Cynthia and also your findings, too? Oh. Yeah, I think I am. Um, so yeah, you can read more about Cynthia in this book after the blast, which in my screen is turned reversed, but you can figure it out. Um, it was published uh, by the University of Washington Press um, about a month ago, and it's you know avail available. Um, yeah, and it, it just sort of looks at all, I don't know, people ask me, you know, if I were to say, what do I want readers to take away from something like this. I, I think the thing that was really interesting for me in working on this was how it lets how it let me sort of look at Mount St. Helens from just so many different angles. Um, and that was really pretty cool to see it, you know, to see Mount St. Helens from the standpoint of a plant, to see it from the standpoint of a small mammal or an amphibian or something like that, to see how this, how the mountain just shaped so much life uh, in the in the blast area and beyond, I mean, fish and everything else, and then the people who've been working on it, just the, the scientific community that sort of grew up around the mountain is is really, it's full of fascinating characters and who are asking interesting questions about a beautiful place. And mm -hmm. yeah, and it, it was it was a lot of fun to work on. So yeah, that's that's my pitch. That's a great pitch. Yeah, I'm excited to read it now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so any last thing, Cynthia, you want folks to um, remember um, before we move on to her and like almost last one, yeah? Um, no, just go out and well, when, when we can go out and enjoy the beautiful natural environment, including Mount St. Helens, it's a very special place. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, if you can give Cynthia and Eric a round of applause and can feel it from all around the spaces again. <laughs> And again, please, um, please support our scientists and our writers um, by purchasing this book and then also maybe going out there too a little later in the summer too. Um, uh, speaking of which, um, we're gonna talk about that exact place with one of my favorite peoples in the world, um, Polly Olson. Um, Polly is um, gonna be on for a little bit. And yeah, do you wanna introduce yourself? I think we can, yeah, how about we try that first? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, I'm Polly. And I'm the tribal liaison for the Burke Museum, and I am a tribal member from Yakima Nation. I was in, I was in ninth grade, which it was still known as junior high, when the eruption happened. And I went to school at Wapato High or Wapato Middle, Wapato Junior High. And that day was a crazy day. That Sunday morning when the mountain blew, Mount Saint Helens dropped. 540 million tons of ash across Washington state, 
about 600,000 tons of ash drop in the Yakima Valley and we were blacked out. When we saw that plume um, coming in our direction, it was, it was, um, it almost was like an apocalypse, right? As, as this ash came in, it was true we had to wear bandanas and uh, stay inside. We, as kids, we wanted to go out inside and feel it and see it. Our parents would let us go out for, for just a short moment um, and they came out with us. It was really an amazing um, thing to live through. And then it just reminds me of what we're going through today through COVID-19. Isolating ourselves, we aren't, we aren't drenched in ash, but we are ha having to be protected from COVID virus. And so it's a different situation, but very similar as we shelter in place. I wanted to speak to the, um, the cultural practices and the importance that the happiness of the joy that, that comes from the eruption of Mount St. Helens, the ash. The ash has been a gift, although it devastated the land and the state. As the ash settled down and integrated into the earth, it became a nutrient for the plants in the area. And it became a nutrient for a very important um, plant and food for the native peoples in Washington state. And that's the huckleberry. Huckleberries love fire. They rejuvenate, they strengthen, they get stronger, and they, they have a nutrients, they have a flavor from the ash from the fires that is just, it's just very unique. And we'll see a video a little bit on, on this as well. So when the ash happened, um, when the eruption happened and the ash fell, it really just enhanced the foods. It harmed the land, yes, but I want you to think about the joy and the nutrients that it did bring back. It was a benefit. And it also provided the researchers and the tribal communities access to um, greater, bigger berry fields as we went as we needed to prepare for our, our daily practices and harvesting of our traditional foods. And so I feel that um, I would just like to share right now a video that we created. I did a cooking demonstration for you this evening on the huckleberry. huckleberry. Oh, I just wanted to show on the screen um, just the ash, uh, like the ash spread, because um, you uh, just to see how far off it went. Right there, you can see Yakima right over there, Pasco, Spokane, so it went even as far as Wyoming too as well. And if you look down here, South Dakota, and then Oklahoma, just right over here, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I just want to share that just to give context of like what you're saying. So where do um, huckleberries usually grow? Um, huckleberries grow in the, it's a high elevation blueberry and they um, grow up above 25,000 feet up to 36,000 feet, give or take. So how would you describe the flavors of huckleberries then? Like, you said there were some that were more watery, right? The closer you are. Or... Well, I feel that the best huckleberries in, in the state of Washington are from uh, the Sawtooth Trout Lake area, just above the Columbia River and near the, the uh, Mount St. Helens uh, National Park area. And I feel that they are very um, earthy and tart, sweet tart, and have a great, a great flavor. As we move north through the Cascades, um, we, they tend to not have as many nutrients and, and um, not as flavorful, I guess. I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit of a huckleberry snob when it comes to uh, picking and sharing our fields, but also the flavors. Um, I love my ancestral lands out on the Columbia River and in, in that zone. And so I have a fondness for, for the the lands that were impacted by the Mount St. Helens eruption. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, so, and you made a video that, that we're gonna share just in a second. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Tim, Tim um, is our uh, beautiful um, IT person who uh, shared that, yes, Tim? 
Should I say your full name? Timothy Francis? Oh, okay. Ooh. Hey Tim, can't we? We can't really hear the audio. We'll try that one more time. Yeah. So, where are you at right now in this video, Polly? Oh, can you say that again? I think you were on mute. What was the question? Oh, where were you at? I video? was here on Ravenna Boulevard, um, sitting in 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 the yard. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and try that video one more time, and hopefully, it should work this round. Okay. Let me know if it doesn't. Let's try it one more time. Ooh, it looks like I still can't hear it. Can you all hear it? Polly, Melissa, no. Okay, so you know what maybe this means? That everyone who's watching right now has to go to our website and has to watch it as well. Yeah, so one thing too, Polly also has another video on where you can make nettle pesto. She was, oh my God. So Polly is starting to have this cooking show. And so we wanted to debut that here with you today, but we had some technical difficulties. So I think you have to all go and watch it yourself. Where, um, hey Tim, where can folks find that video? Uh, Folks can find that video on uh, the Burke Museum's YouTube channel, and uh, it should be the latest video that we've uploaded. You can also find it on all of our social media channels. So feel free to go check those out and give us a follow if you like it. Cool, thank you so much, Tim. Yeah, and thank you so much everyone who's watching this too, as well as we try to work out this very first digital event that we are having here at the Burke. Um, but yeah, Polly, yeah. Well, since we weren't able to watch the video, I, I might as well share that I do have a huckleberry muffin with me. Okay, hold on, hold on. I, I, I need to spotlight your video right now. Okay, there we go. Do it again. <laughs> Thank you. Here is the huckleberry muffin we made for you today to celebrate the honoring of the Mount St. Helens eruption. Sorry, you can't enjoy this with me, but I will enjoy it for you. Thank so so where can folks get huckleberries right now? Right now? Yeah, or is it not now? Um, not now. There are wild huckleberries that sometimes are sold through Trader Joe's, um, through Costco. I'm not a proponent of sharing <laughs> that. I think you need to do the work for your food and for the medicine. So you need to go into the mountains and actually pick them for yourself to actually receive the gift of the medicine from the huckleberry. Uh, is there anything that when folks do go out um, that you want folks to think about or be aware of as they're on, like, on, like on those spaces and lands? That's, that's great. Um, yes, offer, um, introduce yourself to the land when you go out and ask for permission to pick a huckleberry. Also be mindful um, that we want the plants to stay with us for many generations and many have other people um, provide access to those. And so don't rake them. Don't take a, a berry rake and, and rip apart the bushes. Use your hands, engage with the bush, engage with the plant and bond with it and have a relationship as you pick those berries. Be kind because as I said, it is medicine. It's medicine for the indigenous peoples. It's, in, it's medicine for the future generations, the bears and other animals that also feed upon these, these foods. It's really important to be a good steward and share, but yet enjoy the wealth that huckleberry bushes provide us. Oh, that is so beautiful. It just makes me think about just the abundance of bushes. And I think someone shared that bears love them and they would just eat and just hang out and just eat. <laughs> so I would love to see that. Have you ever seen any bears on your like trips or foraging? I have, I went, um, I was deep in the reservation in the closed area of Yakima Reservation and wandering around and there were some black bears with cubs that were nearby. Again, just, I just said, I'm not here to bother you. I'm here to do my own work. You have your bush, I have my bush. 
And so we just kept each other, we kept space from each other and all was well. And it was, it was really a lovely moment to share with the bear relatives as they're preparing to go into hibernation and they needed the energy and the food so that they could um, go into the dream world and get ready for the next season. That's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Our bear relatives. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. As you see behind me as well, um, these are my family uh, cedar root baskets. And I also have my first berry basket. And this berry basket goes out with me every year to pick huckleberries. My uncle gave this to me um, when I was about three years old and I've had, had her with me ever since. And so these are the tools that we use as native peoples in the area. And we still take these, our baskets out. We have to feed them with the berries and the foods that we gather. And so just wanted to share that with you this evening as well. Thank you. Thank you. What is the basket made out of? What material? Bear grass and cedar root. Hmm. Yeah. I'm and not sure how old she is, but um, been with me for many, many generations, many decades. So you, so you would suggest when folks go out berry picking to have a basket of their own or? Yeah. Basket would be good. Make your own um, container. I, I see people use milk milk containers because you can take a belt and wrap it around your waist and, and harvest that way. I love that. You just be resourceful. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you can decorate it too as well with some berries so you know it's, that's your berry picking um, milk container. Yeah. You know when you um, run into a berry picker when they have the purple mouth and purple hands. Because <laughs> they're tasting, right? They've got to make sure that's good, right? You've got to check them. You've got to taste them first. Exactly. Oh my God, beautiful. Thank you so much, Polly. Is there any last thoughts that you want folks to share? Um, I'm, I'm good. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for supporting the Burke. And we look forward to seeing you in the building someday soon. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so I mean, if everyone can give Polly just a little round of applause here as well. Um, let me unspotlight you too. So yeah, so back again to uh, that, 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 that video. You did great, Polly. You did great. I see you breathing right now. <laughs> Let's go do this. <laughs> it's hard to talk to people and not know if you are being watched. And it's, this is such a strange environment we live in right now. Um, but thank you again for everyone who was here. Um, let's do some stories with us too. And so right now we're about to um, just give a, a little moment. Um, we're just about to end our program right now with a musician. Um, uh, her name is Mira. Um, she'll be coming along in a little bit, but before we do that, as we end our program, I just want to do some thank yous to everyone. Um, thank you so much to um, really uh, the Burke staff who helped bring this together um, to all our presenters. Uh, to Melissa, um, to Jeff, to Cynthia and Eric. Um, um, thank you so much for coming here and really just being a part of this conversation too. I know there's a lot of ways we can look at it like at a, at a space, but you know what? Every single year when this, this date comes, we can just make space for more ways to look at it too. Um, and we got the 50th coming up too. So hey, it could be, it'd be even better. Maybe we'll go on a hike. Everyone just go out there and we'll just be in that space and pick huckleberries along the way too. Say hi to the bear ancestors too. Um, um, yeah, thank you again to the staff and uh, thank you again to you, everyone who's watching. So it's gonna take a little moment, you know, just remind ourselves what the journeys we've been on to. And we're just gonna end with um, a, a musician, uh, Mira. Um, as you get settled, let me read your bio, is that okay? Mira? Yes, that's great. Thank you. So Mira is a singer, songwriter, and producer based in Brooklyn, New York. So it's a little late for them. So thank you so much for being here. Um, since starting her musical journey in Olympia, Washington in the early 2000s, Mira has released 11 full-length solo and collaborative recordings, including the 2018 album Understanding, as well as numerous EPs and seven-inch vinyl records. Her songs have appeared on a wide variety of compilations, benefit projects, movies, and television shows. In 2002, Mira released a critically acclaimed record advisory committee, including the track Mount St. Helens, which likens the destructive force of a breakup to the famous volcano and begins as a simple folk song before building to a violently emotional climax. 
according to all music. Yeah, so Mira is here again from Brooklyn. And I heard that you also went to Evergreen State College. I did, yes. I was there from uh, 92 to 96. Oh, wow. So, so, so well, you're straight through. It's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff is also greener, too. So it's nice to have some greeners here. Oh, great. And my ex-partner was a greener as well. So just you're all amazing people, I have to say, folks who went there. Oh, all the people go there, too. For some reason, I just feel like all the cool people go there. <laughs> But yeah, please, if you want to take it away, thank you everyone for um, watching. And before you sing um, anywhere that folks can get your music or look out for you too. All the, all the normal places um, digitally, it's kind of available, uh, you know, digitally. And I also have a web store and a record label. And if people just Google my name, they can find out. Uh, okay. And it's uh, and Mira Music, right? Spelled M-I-R-A-H. If you... Are typing that in that's how you spell it <laughs> <laughs> well, and also i heard that do you do like weekly instagram like live? well since um since mid-march since we've all been uh mostly at home i've been doing um thursday night um very informal live instagram shows um just like 20 or 30 minutes 8 p.m eastern time thursday nights and that's it, um, Mira Music is my handle. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So look, you have two shows tonight, so one before. So thank you so much, Mira. So please take it away. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. You ready? From the morning when I rise from my bed Till the evening when I lay my head in slumber Oh, the loss of you does wreck my days It leaves me with a violent hunger I will never be free from you Till I escape the lion's jaw There's no
song. Everyone, again, please give Mira Music a round of applause from wherever you're watching today. Clap, clap, clap. And again, please uh, check out the music online too. They have uh, what, 13 albums um, to choose from? There's a bunch, yeah. <laughs> so I think there's going to be something for everyone. Um, uh, That's because... right. <laughs> so again, thank you so much, everyone, for this evening. Um, thank you again for watching. Please take care of yourself. I know we're going to end this call. I don't want to end right now because it just seems like we just become friends right now. Like we're just really close friends. But, you know, we got other things to do. And uh, I think Mira is tired. I heard you had a little baby crying. So I don't want to make sure. I don't want you. I don't want to take you away from that. <laughs> cool. So again, if everyone, the last speakers can just wave goodbye. Say goodbye to everyone in internet land. We will see you all later. Hello, Eric. And hello, little one, too. Welcome. Oh, welcome. excellent. Thank welcome. you, everyone. Hey, Cynthia, make the little one say hi. All the little ones come too as well. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye. All right. Ciao.